So you should be able to log into this device with your own UTS credentials. Um, it'll create a profile for you. I believe it's connected to the, okay, it's connected over the wireless network. It's connected over this LAN cable to this acquisition system here. This is an industry standard, industry gold standard Siemens Sim Center SCADAS mobile acquisition system, brand new, just arrived um, from the Netherlands. Um, Siemens is a Belgian company, but the hardware is manufactured in the Netherlands. It's an eight channel, uh, eight dynamic channel system with a VC8E card in here. So this is, this is a charge module, but it will also do volts and ICP or IEPE, -E, right? Remember the integrated electronic keys are electric. Which one of those three options it does is configurable in software. Okay. There's some other, um, there's another module in here, the, the controller module here, um, has some TACO inputs and some CAN bus inputs. Um, power's required here, it's battery operated, so for Patrick you can go mobile with it. Um, if the power's disconnected or we lose power, you know, you can continue testing for an, you know, a few hours. Um, it's got a master-slave module so we can expand it up to make it 16, 32, I mean there's another free slot here so you can already put another 8 channels in here but we can grow it to a 32, 48, blah blah size system. Um, so it's a really powerful state of the art capability. And you've seen SimCenter already, it comes, or we, what you've seen of SimCenter test lab is analysis for the, for the time being. Right? We provided you with some existing data sets and you did some analysis on them in, uh, in the tutorial, in, in, sorry, in the laboratory in week uh, six. So when you have a profile here, I'm presently logged in, but it will look not dissimilar to this. There's a test lab 2206. That's the most recent version of the software. Right? You double click that one, it basically opens Windows Explorer. It's a little bit small for the video. But what you're gonna do for doing a measurement campaign is use a structures acquisition folder. And within there, we've got some options. Impact testing or spectral testing are the ones that are most interesting. In this case, we're going to do an impact testing uh, project. So I'm going to double click the impact testing hyperlink and that's going to start to open me a new project. You'll see it starts to communicate with the hardware. So the LAN cable is now flashing here. That's trying to negotiate, like to communicate with this guy because this guy's going to digitize our analog signals and send them through to the laptop where we're going to save and do analysis and so on, right? I'm really just going to give you a quick start. What I actually want for you to do as part of your project, however, is to get into the Siemens documentation online, have a look on YouTube, have a look in the canvas where I've included a bunch of stuff that Siemens have produced, Siemens Sim Center testing solutions, I think, is their YouTube channel, right? And so they go through a lot of this, like how to get started, how to build a geometry, how to set up your channels, how to build a project, how to do impact analysis and so on, right? But that, that, that's, that part should be reasonably familiar. It's basically a blank template with the exception of the fact that we're in impact testing. I'm going to create a new project, gives me a little warning, um, tells me that if we're opening a project it might have attachments and they could be harmful. Yes, uh, that's fine, it's a new project, I'm not worried about harmful attachments. Um, now it's going to build a project communication again with the hardware. It's, it's preparing a template, a project, a blank project from a template, and, and here we are. So then, you know, these workbooks now are, are, are um, revealed here, and you may remember from modal analysis that essentially we're going to work through from left to right, really. We might not necessarily go to every single one of these workbooks to do a modal acquisition campaign. Um, Navigator is where we can find data, we can browse through Windows Explorer in a similar way. Um, our project is defined here and there's a section here which is currently empty. Right? We can rename this section, or we can, sorry, we can create a new section, or we can rename the existing section. For example, I might want to rename that just to simply set up. I might want to have sections for different days with dates incorporated into them. I might want to have different projects each day and I can do things like save a project with a new file, save a section, create a new section and carry over the settings from the previous section into the new section and there's clearly, you know, for an industry standard application, lots of functionality in here and it, you know, I'm, I'm not wanting to overwhelm you, I'm not expecting you to mask necessarily all of the capability that exists in here, I'm just kind of trying to point you in the right direction. 
one of the things that we need to do when we do modal impact exercise, any modal analysis exercise, is build like is define our geometry. Right? So before we set up channels, actually, we should we should add in the geometry workbook. So we go here. Uh, we can choose the geometry workbook. While I'm here, I might also just show you the modal analysis workbook and add that in at the same time. So when I've got some measurements, I can simply carry on through the workbooks and process those measurements. It'll take a while now to add these in. The, the other way to do modal analysis is to measure the data, save the project, close SimCenter, reopen the modal analysis, structures analysis workbook, and open your previous project. So if you go back to here, SimCenter, go structures analysis instead. In here, I can do modal analysis from here, right? I can actually open those two simultaneously and I would have two versions, but you know, this is what we did in the lab. This is what's available on the workspace. Um, now we're doing measurements, so we're using a slightly different workbook. It's not available in the workspace because there's no point in having it on the workspace. You can't do anything with it without an acquisition system, right? In the lab, we've got an acquisition system. So here's my geometry workbook. Puts it in over at the end over here, okay? I'm gonna just actually change my workbook configuration to make the workflow a bit more sensible. I'm bringing the geometry workbook before the channel setup workbook. If I now normally exit the program and reopen the, spec, uh, the impact testing workbook, it will remember that I've added in these things and organize them in this way, right? So geometry's here. Okay, to build a geometry, I'm going to let you work that out from YouTube videos, right? We go through now this mini workflow up here, first define a component. If it was an assembly, we might have multiple components. They might have their own local coordinate systems. We might give them different colors, right? In this case, we've got one component. It's our plexiglass plate. Once we define our component plexiglass plate, let's call it, or just for simplicity, plate, right? I can accept the table over here, and I've now got a plate, component called plate. I'll then go into the nodes section, and you can see here's my parent component, right? Within here, I can now define nodes, one, two, three, four, five, six, etc. And it's up to you to take your plexiglass plate, discretize your continuous geometry down into a number of degrees of freedom. And as part of the project, you might say, well, let's look at, you know, six degrees of freedom. We'll do six measurements initially. I know that I can probably see the first two or three modes of vibration for six degrees of freedom. If I want to look at five, six, seven uh, degrees of freedom, or mode shapes, I should say, I need more degrees of freedom. So I might need 15. In the example, we looked at in the lab, I had 15. You know, if I start to divide those in half again, all of a sudden like we almost exponentially get a lot of degrees of freedom to test. And doing three averages, right, for each of my degrees of freedom with my impact hammer, if I've got 50 degrees of freedom or 100 degrees of freedom, I'm going to be here a long time, right? So you're going to have to find some sort of a cutoff and say, okay, we know we can get the first five natural frequencies with 25 degrees of freedom, and we're going to organize them in this way. Normally, we spread them out evenly on there, right? And then I get the ruler, and I measure them, right? And then I define my X, Y coordinates in here. It's a flat plate, so there's not going to be any Z. Okay? But as I say, you can find a lot of this out in YouTube videos, and I'm going to leave you to work that out subsequently for yourselves. Then we're going to come to the channel setup sheet here, and this is pretty important because what we do with modal impact with channel setup is we use we do this in conjunction with our geometry. Now I don't have any geometry at the moment, but if I'd built the geometry I'd have a wireframe representation here of my plexiglass plate with my nodes named accordingly, plate colon one, plate colon two, plate colon three, and so on and so forth. And I would say, okay, I'm gonna put my acceleration accelerometer at plate colon four, and I'm gonna start impacting at plate colon one. So I'm gonna highlight plate colon one and plate colon four in here, and add them or associate them with one or the other of the channels that are, that are active in my channel setup, right? And that's going to change the naming here. I'm also going to need to define the direction, right? Which is just going to be Z or minus Z, depending upon whether my transducer is mounted on the top surface, or I might be better off to mount it on the bottom surface. What's the difference? That's part of the project. Work out, is there any difference? Okay. Can we do this? Does it affect our measurements? Certainly it makes it easy to do our impacts if we haven't got an accelerometer in the way 
degree of freedom number four, right? And you know, the type of signal conditioning I mentioned here, we've got volts, right? We can AC couple or DC couple, ICP and charge, yes? These are ICP based transducers. So we're gonna to need to turn them onto ICP here in the channel setup. And this light should go green if we've got uh, a proper connection to our transducer. Okay. Um, this one's still looking a little bit blue. Not sure what that means. Have I? Uh, I've changed the wrong one, right? So that was on charge instead of ICP. I've just changed the wrong channel. Right, so now these two are both on ICP and these channels have gone green. So we're good to go. And then we can go to, the, we can maybe look at the calibration setup. We want to calibrate our transducer or get the relative sensitivity for the transducer. Because I haven't really told you about that in the channel setup sheet, but we can define sensitivities also in here. We know, we know about needing to get sensitivities defined. We've done a lot of that. And then we can go to the impact scope sheet here. And if I've done things correctly, um, and I'm using a free display limit, right? When I do an impact, you can see impact response. Impact response. I mean, it's happening quickly, right? Because I'm not yet triggering. But that's just checking that my channels are working, right? So I'm going to go around the plate, doing an impact, collecting the response, and that will give me an FRF. So I progress through into the impact setup. Now I can start to define things like triggering, right? So start the scope, do an impact. There's my impact, right? There's another one. So triggering looks okay. I might increase the triggering a little bit here. Oops, backspace. Where's my trigger threshold gone? Uh, I'll leave it for now, but you can, I think, get into this a little bit through the tutorials online. I want you to have a go and explore, and I'm sure you can. Right? I'm just pointing you in the right direction. We can do a bandwidth check. Bandwidth is about the tip stiffness. We can do a couple of impacts and make sure I'm exciting over the range of, of interest that I want to excite over. Right? So let's do an impact. Right? There's my characteristic impulsive frequency spectrum. Here are some good looking peaks that look like they might be responses. Yes. Second one, this is a four times bandwidth. Um, so this is my bandwidth, this is four times the bandwidth, it's kind of the same data but just with a longer frequency range. That looks pretty good to me. Alright, I can apply some windowing, might want to explore rectangular windows, other types of windows. Please have a look at that. It tells me initially force exponential for this one, exponential for the response, that's, that's normal. And, and then I can just go into the measure sheet and I can actually start collecting FRFs. But there are a few things that I've skipped over here. How good these will be, I'm not sure. But, but I can just do an impact. Right, and I get some audio feedback as well from the software when I'm doing this. Okay, I've done a couple of impacts. Here's my, um, I've got no pre-triggering, so I'm a little bit premature. Like, this is my impulse, this is my frequency spectrum, this is my response. This is the frequency spectrum for the response, and we can see different levels of natural frequencies here. Um, here's an instantaneous FRF, right? So we can see some peaks in there. There's quite a lot of damping. Remember, it's, you know, it's on a suspension here that adds a bit of damping. Maybe we want to put it on bungees. We can explore the inf influence of uh, the suspension system as part of your project. Right? As soon as I've done more than one average, then I get a coherence function. Remember, my coherence function should be close to one all the way along we've got a really nice looking coherence function with the exception of at the anti-resonances okay where we've got low response so we get low signal to noise ratio but I can continue to work through this and it's looking for five averages from me I can change that to three if I want to do my experiment quicker if this is changing significantly every time I do another one of these yeah, then that's a problem right the idea is that this should at some point start to head towards like that's my FRF if I do 10 averages this shouldn't change 20 averages 30 averages and so on at some point like the, the value of doing more averages de decreases okay and then I've moved to my next point and I have to change my channel naming and, and so on and so forth but as I say you can explore that 
And basically that's now one FRF. It's not properly named because I didn't choose the points and all the rest of it. But in here, now I've got a run with some FRFs and some other functions in it. Yeah, so I can put a Bode plot on here, right click on here, change this to preview mode. Have a look in this uh, folder here. Uh, Deselect all of the filters. There are some filters on here. So make sure that those filters just are, are turned off. There's a couple of filters that are just on here. So I show all the functions. There's my FRF. And hey presto, I've got a nice looking FRF. Probably a rigid body mode here. First flexural mode maybe, maybe another rigid body mode, not sure. Flexural modes start to appear in here, right? These rigid body modes are quite high in frequency because this suspension is quite stiff, right? If I had a less stiff suspension, these frequencies would come down. I know the rigid body modes because I'm experienced. I don't expect you to know that because you're inexperienced, but as part of working through this project, you will find these things out. What we want is a nice large gap between the first flexural mode and the highest rigid body mode, and that tells us that we've got a good suspension. But you work through this, you tell me like, what it is that you're doing, that's the point of the exercise.